salt, fat, carbs, calories. If it seems as if everything you thought you knew about diet and nutrition has been turned upside down during the past decade, well, it's because much of it has been, and our next guest can take some of the credit for that. His book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, upended conventional wisdom on what was making us fat. He's continued to work on that essential question, and now science journalist and author Gary Taubes has a new book out. It's called The Case Against Sugar that might just pull your sweet tooth once and for all. And Gary Tabbs joins us now with more. Very nice to meet you. Well, thank you for having me. I want you, if we can off the top here, to have you take us through the history of the rise of sugar consumption and how that just coincidentally happened at the same time as the rise in diabetes. Okay, so we'll start uh, 200 years ago when uh, the, the people in North America, Americans, Canadians, were probably consuming around five pounds of sugar per capita, which is uh, maybe the sugar in a can of Coke every, 12 ounce can of Coke every six days. So with the Industrial Revolution, uh, refining gets cheaper, beet sugar comes in, so sugar is refined from sugar cane. Then we get uh, Napoleon, who needed a sugar supply during the War of 1812 that helps create the beet sugar industry, and now in temperate climates can grow sugar too, including Canada and the US, and sugar prices plummet. And as it plummets, we start to consume more and more sugar. And then in the 1840s, you get the beginning of the candy industry, the chocolate industry, and the ice cream industry. So all the ways we consume sugar today that seem so natural and so much a part of our lives actually didn't exist 200 years ago. Back then, sugar was very expensive. It was the you know, male head of the household who got the treat of sugar every week. We start with the 1840s, it starts getting marketed to children and women. 1870s, you start seeing the soft drink industry come in with um, uh, Dr. Pepsi, uh, Dr. Pepper, then Coca-Cola, then Pepsi, and by the 1920s, we're already consuming about 100 pounds per capita per year. The industry is making available that much, and if you think about it. Like, you couldn't even drink soft drinks in the home, right, until you had refrigerators and freezers to keep them cool. And that comes in in the 1930s. Um, fruit juices come in in the 1930s. Packed with and then sugar. Packed with sugar in the 1940s. And then finally, the last one along in this trail is the uh, sugary cereal. Uh, the cereal industry started in the US at Post and Kellogg, where they ran sanatoriums. So they were sort of health nuts. And they knew that you shouldn't eat sugar. They believed you shouldn't eat sugar. So their company nutritionists kind of prevented the inevitable until about 1948 when uh, Post comes along with sugar crisps. And then for the next 10 years, you see this sort of ironic or amusing battle between the marketers and the cereal industry and the, the nutritionists who are saying, no, 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 we can't do it. And the marketers who say, if we don't produce our own sugary cereals, we're done. And by the 1960s, the whole North American diet has been turned into this sort of, you know, it's sugar for sugary cereals and juice for breakfast and sodas and snacks, sugary snacks in between. And I bet not a single individual went more than three hours without a sugar hit. And consumption has now increased 20 to 30 fold from what it was. And then you go back and you look at diabetes rates and you know, you can find hospital records pre-1860 in that Boston Mass General Hospital going back to 1820, and there were years in which they didn't see a single case of diabetes. Now, to put that in perspective, let me rephrase that. They didn't diagnose a single case of diabetes. Maybe they missed it. Today, 1 in 11 Americans is diabetic. There are some First Nations populations in Canada where one in two adults are diabetic. And are losing feet and hands because yeah. of it. Yeah, and it's a tragedy. And you can see in the medical records and in the journal articles and the discussion, you could see the, can the diabetes appearing in the populations. And by 1920, Elliot Jocelyn, the most famous uh, American uh, diabetes specialist is calling it an epidemic, and he's estimating that one in 300, well, by 1935, he's estimating one in 300 Americans have diabetes. So tell me this then, why is it, or how is it possible that the medical community did not put together what is pretty obvious to you is a well, connection? Well, and, and the argument I make in my book is that it was always the prime, sugar was always the prime suspect, and they did put it together. 
So in 1924, the, the New York City Public Health Commissioner said, look, we've got these epidemics of diabetes. Mortality has increased 15-fold since the Civil War in coincidence with sugar consumption. And we know this is a disorder of carbohydrate intolerance. You can't process the carbs you consume, and sugar is a carbohydrate. It should be the prime suspect. You know, Elliot Jocelyn didn't believe it. Um, the problem with medicine is scientists are taught to, young scientists are taught to distrust everything. Trust only that which you can prove is sort of one of the dogma of science, and that nothing would make a young scientist happier than proving that his mentor, his beloved father figure, was wrong. Um, in medicine, they're not taught like that. They're basically, there's so much they have to learn. I don't know, they're taught to trust authority figures. And in this case, the one authority figure in the, the biggest, the god of diabetes was Elliot Jocelyn. And for completely incorrect reasons, he did not believe sugar caused diabetes. Hmm. So it kind of vanished from the scene. And meanwhile, you have this, uh, the, the most common form of diabetes is type 2. That's the one that associates with age and obesity. And um, they believe, well, f most diabetics are obese. Clearly, obesity causes diabetes, which is a leap in logic that's unjustified. But that's where they went to. And if obesity causes diabetes, then it's caused by gluttony and sloth and not sugar. Mm. And this is what we embrace. So. 1960s come along, we're aware that there's rampant heart disease throughout the Western world, and the bulk of the nutrition and obesity and cardiology community blames it on fat. And some nutritionists, and very influential nutritionists, say, hey, sugar, look at every one of these sort of metabolic abnormalities that go with heart disease, and there's a cluster of them can be caused by sugar, and I could do it in my animal, rat, laboratory animals, I could do it in my college students that I use for studies, but there's a battle among the researchers and fat wins out, and the Sugar Association, the sugar industry doesn't like these influential nutritionists blaming the world on sugar, uh, by now obesity, heart disease, and diabetes, so they hire these other influential researchers who believe fat is a problem, and you know, one thing leads to another. Very okay. successful. Hold off on that because I'm going yeah. to come back to that. But I yeah. want to—I I do want to take a step back and put this yeah. into the, into I think a little bigger context. Everything we put in our mouth, the body metabolizes in some way, shape, or form. Right. How does the body metabolize sugar differently from other foods? Okay, so sugar is when we're and it's an excellent question because this is something like, for instance, when Jocelyn rejected this idea, he didn't know what sugar was. He had. If he had been taught his biochemistry in med school, he forgot it. So when we talk about sugar, we're talking about uh, molecules that are roughly half a simple carbohydrate called glucose and a simple carbohydrate called fructose. So that's what sucrose is, white sugar. It's what high fructose corn syrup is, a slightly different proportion of the same molecules. Um, the fructose is what makes it sweet. And fructose is fruit sugar because it's also in fruit, it's in vegetables, but much smaller doses. And it's much harder to get to it and digest it. So when we consume these molecules, the sugar is digested. The glucose goes into our bloodstream. It raises blood sugar. Blood sugar is glucose. And it's metabolized by every cell in our body. The fructose is metabolized primarily by the liver. And there's a condition called insulin resistance, which is the fundamental defect in type 2 diabetes. And it's so closely associated with obesity that I, for one, would say it's at least a viable hypothesis that it causes it. Mm -hmm. And the researchers who study insulin resistance believe it starts in the liver. And it starts with fat accumulation in the liver. And one thing we do when we have, our liver has to metabolize a lot of fructose at one time, which it does when you drink a soda or a juice is converted into fat in the liver. And along with obesity and diabetes, we're also seeing epidemics of what's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this happens in children as well as adults and tens of millions of people. So 30 years ago, we didn't know this existed. If you were diagnosed with fatty liver disease and you told your doctor you didn't drink alcohol, he'd assume you were lying. <laughs> Then it starts showing up in children, and the I don't drink alcohol excuse suddenly seems Doesn't reasonable. Yeah. So we have this whole cluster of diseases that are sort of liver-centric. And there we have 
the fructose part of sugar being metabolized in the liver. And the scientists would say it's a good story. And then the question is, is it a true story? And that's what I'm arguing in this book, but I'm also admitting that we don't have definitive evidence. Mm. There is a view out there, though, that all calories are created equal. Right. And as long as you exercise and burn off more calories than you take in, yeah. you'll be able to keep your weight under control and stay healthy. Right. Why do we, for those who hold that view, why do we hold that view? Well, and this is you know, one of the things I've been arguing, because I'm a journalist, I'm not a PhD, and I'm not an MD, so I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian. Why listen to me? And the one answer is because I've done more research on this subject than virtually anyone alive, and I can tell physicians and nutritionists why they hold beliefs that they don't even know the origin of. So one of the fascinating things, all my books are about good science and bad science. I have to say, if you write about nutrition, they sell better than if you write about physics. Um, <laughs> from 18, late 1860s to 1930s, say, all of nutrition was, died, was dominated by two uh, approaches to understanding how foods influence. One was how much energy they contained. In the late 1860s, German researchers create these devices called calorimeters that allow them to measure the energy expended by humans or dogs, you know, larger subjects. So they can measure the energy into to humans by burning foods in these calorimeters and you measure how much heat's released and that tells you the energy. Or, and now you can measure the energy expended. And so that's what they did. And if you were to find a nutrition book from 1930, a history book, every chapter is about either calorimetry, this measure of calories in and calories out, or vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So by 1920, we have a hypothesis of obesity that it's about calories in versus calories out. And that's all we've got. That's all they can measure. As opposed to the type of calories. As well, as opposed to what those cal the foods might do to any other part of mm -hmm. your body. So the field of endocrinology, which is the study of hormones and hormone-related diseases, to say it was in its infancy is to exaggerate its state in 1920. Mm -hmm. And yet, I have uh, JAMA art articles from the Journal of the American Medical Association, 1924, where physicians are saying clearly uh, obesity is not a hormonal disorder. That's just an excuse for fat people not to have to eat in moderation. And they don't even know what a hormone is, the people who are writing this <laughs> stuff. Um, so disregard all of that. Disregard <laughs> all of that. So yeah, from 1920 on, where the field of medicine exploded, and in 1906, beginning in 1960, with the invention of a technology that allowed researchers to measure hormones in the bloodstream accurately, we could actually understand what hormones control fat regulation, fat accumulation. And we can understand the effect of different foods, macronutrients, fat, protein, and carbohydrates, and the type of carbohydrates on those hormones. But whom, whom do you hold responsible for the fact that many people don't distinguish between uh, the notion of, as long as I burn off enough calories that I take in, it doesn't matter what I put in my body? Well, and that's the scientific and research community. In fact, in my first book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, the epilogue, where my editor finally let me sort of say what I thought, he was very great, terrific editor. He took out all my anger and dismay at what I had learned. And then I said, I look, I never, if you'll notice, I never use the book scientists. I never use the word scientist to describe the people doing research in this confluence of nutrition, obesity, and diabetes. Because by what I've learned in my career, and I was an investigative science journalist, they don't act like scientists. They don't do what scientists have to do. So they embrace this sort of incredibly naive concept that obesity is an energy balance thing, calories in over. It's like if we, you were doing a show with somebody, we were talking about uh, socioeconomic uh, disparities, and you said, why are the rich people getting so rich? And I said, because they're making more money than they spend. It's like you would turn to your crew and say, how do we get this guy in the show? <laughs> but if yeah. it's obesity, it's well, because they're taking in more calories. And mm -hmm. logically, there's no difference. Mm -hmm. It's Obesity, and this is, there was a German-Austrian school, uh, best, I mean, the Germans, Austrians in medicine pioneered the fields of metabolism, nutrition, endocrinology, uh, genetics, all the fields relevant to obesity, and they said clearly this is a hormonal metabolic disorder. When they vanished with the Second World War, regrettably, they didn't have the technology to identify what hormones, but by the 1960s, we did. You, you go back to World War II, and that, yeah 
puts in my head Dwight D. Eisenhower. President Eisenhower used to love putting sweetener in his, what, what beverages that he? Uh, coffee. In his coffee. coffee. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if the president does it, it's got to be okay, right? Well, that, not according to the sugar industry. So, yeah, I think it was 1955, Eisenhower's photograph putting saccharin in his coffee. And it, there's an explanation. His doctor said, if you don't want to get fat, don't use sugar, use saccharin. The sugar industry, I remember the New York Times headline was, Sugar Men Soured by President Photo. <laughs> um, what are they going to do, right? Now they've got this if sugar to them. Their, their lifeblood was making this argument that a calorie is a calorie is a calorie, that there's nothing unique about sugar. Yeah, it tastes good, you consume a lot of it, but you can balance it. Mm -hmm. So they start a PR campaign in 1956, basically arguing that sugar is not fattening. But the logic they use is exactly what the nutritionists and obesity researchers believe. A calorie is a calorie. There's no such thing as a fattening food. It's not what we eat, it's how much we eat. And, this is, you know, there's, I love they'd have these ads where they say three teaspoons of sugar have no more calories than your breakfast egg, which means four teaspoons would, but that's irrelevant. The question <laughs> is, what's the physiological and hormonal effect of consuming sugar compared to consuming the egg? They're entirely different, and the sugar would create a hormonal milieu, which is a term they use, that... Uh, favors fat accumulation, which is a way of saying it's fattening. Can you categorically, definitively now say that too much sugar makes you fat? Well, yes, because saying too much sugar is a, a tautology, right? Too much okay. of anything is bad for you. Can I definitively say that sugar makes you causes fat. obesity? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. You can't say that No, yet. and I say in the book, this is the prosecution's argument. Mm -hmm. So I'm making an argument that I think has to be made, that sugar was always the prime suspect of obesity and diabetes. I mean, leaving beer drinkers out of it, OK? Um, sugar was always the prime suspect. It should have remained the prime suspect because of these extremely effective public relations campaigns by the sugar industry and the gift that the new bad science that the nutrition and obesity researchers gave to the sugar industry to use they managed to divert our attention for 30 or 40 years. And now, only now are we doing beginning to do the research. Gary, let's do this. I want to play a clip from a representative of the Canadian Sugar Institute, uh, who you won't be surprised to hear disagrees with just about everything you've had to say, and then we'll get your comments coming out. Sheldon, if you would, roll the clip. Never mind they got the soda pop out already. Mm -hmm. They want to go after the fruit juices now and mm -hmm. take the fruit juice vending machines out of schools. Is that a mistake? Um, I, there is no evidence, um, when you look at the totality of evidence, there's no evidence that having some fruit juice is harmful. So, um, some being the key word. That's right. I think everything in moderation is a key component of our diet. And um, eliminating a healthy source of some vitamins and minerals and energy, I'm not sure is the uh, correct way to go. Gary, your serve. Well, there's a lot of issues there. The first is this concept of everything in moderation. So, you know, we know cigarettes cause lung cancer, and clearly there's a point at which you've smoked too many cigarettes and you now on the way to lung cancer, but we would never say too much cigarettes. Too much smoking causes lung cancer. We say smoking causes lung cancer. There's no way to use that product moderately and healthily at the same time. Uh, there might be, but we, you know, the, the point is that moderation, that you know, it's clearly smoking causes lung cancer. It's possible you could smoke four cigarettes a day. I bet you could smoke four cigarettes a day and never get, get cancer. But your doctor, when you come and you're a smoker, doesn't say cut back to four days. Says quit smoking because smoking causes lung cancer. Right. Same with alcohol and fatty liver disease. Clearly there's a point, actually nutritionists think a couple glasses of wine a day is good for you, but at some level too much alcohol causes fatty liver disease. That's not what we say. We say alcohol causes it. I, if sugar causes obesity and diabetes, it's not about too much. There probably is a level where it's too much, but we have to get to the point where we say sugar causes. What I would say about the representative from the sugar industry is she said, I'm not sure, which is fascinating. I'm not sure that you know we should go this far as say none. We should get these things out. It's, 2017, we have these tragic pandemic, you know, 
obesity and diabetes epidemics everywhere in the world. In the United States, the estimate is, the conservative estimate is obesity and diabetes are, the direct cost to healthcare is $1 billion a day. You should explain that. How, how, do, they, how do they come up with, I mean, a billion dollars a day represents what? And well, you mean $365 billion a year? <laughs> I'm no, not I sure mean, I understand the question. As a result of? As a, as a result of complications from obesity and diabetes are associated with every other chronic disease. So it's absenteeism from work. It's no, that's indirect cost to society. Now uh, we're talking a trillion dollars a year. The numbers get a little foggier. You got to trust the economic. No, we're just talking health care costs. Um, the pharmaceutical, the drug costs for the diabetics, the surgical costs, the um, all the disorders associated with these diseases. So not even the broader cost to society. Not or the, the broader cost to society. Hmm. So, you know, one of the arguments I'm making, this is a tragedy. They actually, the Director General of the World Health Organization, Margaret Chan, spoke at the National Academies of Science's annual meeting in October, and she called this a slow motion disaster. She pointed out it's happening worldwide. The adults living with Diabetes in 2016 was, I think, a fourfold increase since around worldwide since 2000. But Gary, you go and, further. You you say you say in the book that sugar has probably killed more people than tobacco. You well, feel comfortable if sugar, saying that? if yeah, it, it probably is a key word. Sugar, <laughs> if sugar it causes obesity and diabetes, it's killed more people than tobacco. And there's another easier way. There's a way I can say that safely, and I discuss in the book is. Um, if we're accounting the tobacco deaths, lung cancer and heart disease and emphysema, um, the great uh, technological breakthrough in the late 19th century in the tobacco industry was a technology called flu curing tobacco. And what flu curing did, and aside from drying the tobacco, is it increased the sugar content of the tobacco by a factor of 10, from about 2% to 20%. So making it even more addictive. Making it easier to inhale, making it inhalable. So you get more alkaline smoke, and when you get more alkaline smoke, you could draw it into your lungs without triggering a cough reflex. Mm -hmm. So you could draw the cigarette smoke into the lungs, and then you could draw the carcinogens into the lungs, and then they mix this flu-cured tobacco in 1913 and the first American blended cigarette, which was Camel. They mix the flu-cured tobacco with tobacco from what's called plug tobacco or chewing tobacco, and that's it's literally sugar sauce. It's marinated in sugar, maple syrup, licorice, and that's got a high sugar content. That's got a high nicotine content. So now you could draw the nicotine into your lungs, the carcinogens into your lungs. You could addict, you know, hundreds of millions of people worldwide, and it's a you create toxic this. Like, stew. It's, yeah. you know. Tina, how am I doing on time? One minute. Okay, last question. Um, I don't mean this to sound as facetious as it will sound. We get it, but is life worth living if you can't have chocolate chip <laughs> cookies? Okay, uh, two things inform my writing of this book. One, I'm a parent of two pre-adolescent boys, and uh, monitoring, their, even if I wasn't a zealot, and I admit that I am, I'm monitoring their sugar consumption. I think most parents would consider somewhat of a full-time, or one of the primary obligations. The second is I used to be a smoker. And when you, use, when you smoke cigarettes, you cannot imagine life without it. Mm. You just can't. It, it, it's integrated into every moment of your life, the happy ones, the sad ones. It modulates every emotional response. It's, but you're you a know. former smoker. But I'm a former smoker. So you smoker. got religion. I didn't want to kill myself, right? Mm -hmm. That's what the, the good science did for us. And the point is you get to a point that first you try to quit. You're miserable, you've got cravings, you're unhappy, you're depressed, you're angry, you alienate your friends. For a year, life doesn't seem worth living. And eventually you get to the point that you can't imagine you ever smoke. And so I'm. And you think that's where we need to go? I think we can get there. I know people who get there. You know, it, maybe you don't have to go that far, but I think we should all experiment, consider trying. Less sugar. Less sugar. If not, none. Gary, as I thank you for coming into TVO tonight, I want to remind everybody your book is called The Case Against Sugar. And we should also say, if Gary looks somewhat familiar to you, you may have seen on TVO a year ago the documentary called Sugar Coated, in which you are featured. And if you missed the documentary then, it's on our website, tvo.org. Search for Sugar Coated. You'll see Gary and the documentary. Thanks so much.
Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.